talk about today um, is a set of experiments um, specifically about um, design of uh, enclosures and also looking at some dietary components for the improving ex situ conservation of amphibians. But really, the idea I'm trying to get across to people is that we can use some sometimes very simple uh, experimental approaches to make sure that when we're trying to improve uh, husbandry, we're actually showing uh, evidential basis to that. Right? So we're not just doing our best guesses to improve things. Um, at the bottom here, uh, I put this to remind myself uh, that uh, all of the lovely photos here are by Vicki Ogilvy uh, that she took during her PhD, and I'm going to be talking about some of her work today. Uh, I've tried to improve on her photos, but failed quite miserably. So I'm going to talk first about a little bit of field research, and really that's just to remind people that we really need to go out and look in the field to define what it is that's important and how we might try and replicate that when we bring things into ex situ conservation. If we're not replicating conditions in the field as much as possible, and we won't be able to do everything, but if it's not as much as possible, then ultimately, if those animals are there for the purposes of reintroduction, um, that may fail. And if there's an, an issue of maintaining them as a breeding population, um, it's important to base that on what's actually their environment in the wild. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to talk about lab research, um, looking at systematic experimental approaches to try and find those optimal conditions. Field work. Um, and Chris, who is just uh, speaking to you ahead of this, has said many times that we actually need to have that first essential step of field work. Um, that may take the form of just general surveys to know what's out there, what they're eating, where they live. Um, it may be specific things like body condition. Um, We've got some people who are looking at this in amphibians, but you may be aware of the situation where people looked at ring-tailed lemurs and discovered them in the zoos were pretty much all obese compared to animals in the wild. So are, are we um, keeping animals in a condition that is what they should be like in the wild? We may be out looking at size and genetics of populations to know how we should be managing um, those populations in captivity and should we be mixing them or not? Um, and we may be out there doing studies of natural diets and behavior. So I'm just going to give a quick example, a very brief example of some field work. So this is some work with Agalichnus moraletti uh, done by Vicky Ogilvy. Um, it's a species that needed to be brought into ex situ conservation because it was listed as critically endangered. We know it's got lovely bright orange coloration to the legs, the arms, flanks, and, and their feet. Um, and that orange coloration is likely to be carotenoid based. Um, but we also know that for this species and for lots of other amphibians, coloration is often lost and they go kind of dull after we had them in captivity, um, even within a generation, but m very often over multiple generations. Um, and sometimes it's also important to know why. Okay, yes, they're becoming less colorful when we bring them into captivity, but does that actually matter um, to the maintenance of these animals? So here's an example of work on more or less in Belize, a population site of Los Cuevas. Um, and on this axis, we've got a measure of the redness of the toe pads, I believe, in these individuals. Oh, no, sorry, planks and legs of these individuals uh, for all males in the population and for males that were in amplexus. Uh, and what you can see is that for both uh, flanks and legs of individuals, those males that are mating in the process of, of amplexus have brighter redness on their uh, flanks and legs. So it is something that we need to maintain in captivity because it's actually important for mating success in this species. Now, what we often find when things are brought into 
um, ex situ conservation is that we just have a lack of species specific knowledge of what these things should be looking like in the wild. Um, we bring them into the lab, we put them into a nice little container. Uh, it's highly unlikely to have the correct conditions in a small box, um, just because we guess that that's probably right. Um, some of the things that we're actually rushing to bring into captivity are some of the things that are most sensitive to having the right conditions in those boxes. And of course, uh, there are all the problems of adaptation to captivity that we might have uh, in ex situ conservation. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about some work that Chris uh, Michaels did during his PhD. He just gave the talk before this one. Um, and just looking at enclosure design. So this is the very most basic part of husbandry. Uh, if you went to lots of different ex situ populations, you would find all kinds of different best practice approaches. Um, very little of that is based on any sort of evidence of what we actually ought to have there. Um, but it's likely to have impacts on the welfare of the individuals, their ability to reproduce, whether they get sick, um, how much nutrition they need, and whether they're getting the right nutrition, and on the practicalities of maintaining them. So here on the left, we've got a lovely planted up naturalistic uh, 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 sorry, uh, tank. Uh, on the right, we've got a nice, clean, easy to maintain, a Spartan tank, and in the middle, some sort of compromise between these two things. And of course, as you would expect, oops, um, this setup is a little bit harder to maintain, costs more money, both in terms of what's in there and the time people spend looking after them. And these ones over here and these sort of clinical conditions are easy to maintain and relatively inexpensive. Um, but may not be the best for the animals that we're trying to keep. So let's have a look at some of um, some experiments where we try to look at um, the effects of shelter, and in this case, looking at plants. So these were experiments that Chris did. Um, there are some really obvious effects of having appropriate shelter in there. It allows individuals to have behavioral regulation in terms of temperature, humidity, exposure to UVB. It's gonna change the level of interactions that individuals have with each other, other individuals in the tank. Uh, and it may be important for the reproduction of individuals. That's pretty common. Um, there's also going to be a set of secondary effects. So it's going to alter the perceived vulnerability that individual amphibians have to their surrounding environment. Uh, it's going to change their exposure to um, bacteria, which is going to be incredibly important. Um, I've got a lot of other stuff I could tell you about uh, amphibian skin bacterial communities and the importance of that, uh, but that's a whole separate research talk. But that is influenced by the, the tank conditions. Um, and of course, it's also going to influence the food that the animals perceive and their ability to forage. So it may be treated as a, a kind of enhancement to their environment. So I'm going to look first uh, with some experiments in Agalignus calidryas, looking at the behavior of individuals and the development in this species. Um, so this is an experiment where, very simple, uh, we've got tadpoles of Calidryas, um, either in tanks. This B tank has absolutely nothing in it. It's just a bare tank. Uh, the S tank is a tank that's um, exactly the same as the bear tank, but just has shade over it, so it's not as bright. And then this A tank over here has an artificial plant in it, and the L tank has a live plant in it. So we're asking, is there importance of, is it the light intensity? Is it having cover? Does it need to be a live plant? And the way that Chris looked at that uh, was to actually um, place tadpoles in these tanks and let them acclimate in there for about 13 days. And then he looked at the startle response of these individuals just to tap on the side of the tank. Okay, So these tadpoles will launch themselves out of the water as a startled response. Um, and then uh, at metamorphosis, 
uh, around week four to six, he measured the size of those individuals that came out. And we get some very clear results from this. So this is the startle response of individuals, so the number of individuals who jumped in response to a tap on the tank. Um, and you can see that um, it's quite high in those individuals that were in the bear tank. It goes down a little bit with some shade there, but it's really quite a lot lower if there's either an artificial or a live plant in the tank. So if they've got some shelter available, there's a change in their perception uh, of the environment, and that turns into a startled response of, of individuals being reduced. Uh, it also uh, has an effect on their growth. This isn't as dramatic of a graph as the other one, uh, but you can see that those individuals with cover available, um, either a live plant or an artificial plant, uh, come out larger than individuals in a bear tank or individuals uh, just with shade there. Um, and it's about a 15% increase in the size of individuals, uh, whether they have shelter or when there's no shelter. Okay? So that's a reasonably big effect uh, for something quite simple that we can put in a tank. He then went on to look at juvenile development of individuals. So these are uh, same, same uh, Calidryas species here and individuals as juveniles were placed into tanks either with nothing else in there but their water, so it's a typical uh, clinical setup, or a lovely planted out tank with lots of plants in there. And then those individuals were measured for snout vent length at the beginning, 90 and 180 days, and weighed at 90 and 180 days. Uh, and what we see uh, here on the left first, this is the mean snout vent length. Um, and you can see that individuals are increasing in size over time. That's what we would expect. They start out about the same. Uh, but very quickly we see that the frogs that are in planted tanks, those are the green bars here, are larger than those individuals that are in the non-planted tanks. Um, and the same is true if we look at body mass over here on the, on the right, um, those individuals that are in the planted tanks come out heavier than those individuals in the non-planted tanks. And that's about a 10% difference in size here, uh, just because we've actually got some plants in the tank while they're growing up. So again, you know, a reasonably big effect. This is the bit that I think is actually quite fascinating. So those same individuals from that previous experiment were then, once they became adults, um, placed into one of these large tanks um, where there's an artificial plant on one side and there's nothing on the other side nice little water dish in the middle, um, and individuals are free to move around, and Chris went through and scored uh, several times and just observed which side of the tank individuals moved to. So if they moved to the side where the shelter was, in this case an artificial plant, they got a score of one. If they were on the side where there was nothing, there's a score of zero. And what we see here is this is their mean cover score. So in the middle here, the dashed red line uh, shows no preference at all. That's, that's there were found equal numbers of time on the side with uh, shelter with a, a planted side as they were on the non-planted side. So the thing you can see right away is that all of the frogs prefer to be on the side where there's some shelter. That's not uh, surprising. Um, but those individuals who grew up in a tank where there was no planting are pretty much going under that shelter and just staying there and they don't come out. Whereas those individuals who have grown up as juveniles in a tank where there was shelter actually come out a fair bit and go over to the open side of the tank. Okay? So there's quite an interesting effect later on in the life of these individuals of what their early rearing environment was. Um, and I think that's quite fascinating because we often hear uh, about amphibians sort of being black boxes that are hardwired. Um, but this suggests that that's not quite true. They're not automatically going to shift to whatever um, uh, response we would think they should always have. There is a memory in these individuals of what their 
earlier developmental environment was. Okay, so we know shelter has significant beneficial effects for both tadpoles and adults, uh, and that probably then justifies the extra cost that we have to put in and the extra time to make sure that there is shelter provision because it's gonna have a direct benefit to the frogs and it's safeguarding that whole big investment that we've put into having some animals in ex situ conservation. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on now to talk quite a bit about diet, looking at uh, frog nutrition and mostly color and carotenoids of individuals. So carotenoids, just to remind people, are those pigments that are uh, yellow, orange, and red that we see in all live things in the world around us. Um, they are responsible for color in animals, so what you see in flamingos, bright red ladybird beetles, um, bright colors in fish, um, so birds, okay, those are all carotenoids are causing most of those colors that you see, um, but no animals actually make carotenoids. They actually need to eat them. Carotenoids are actually made by plants and bacteria and fungi as well, but mostly animals are getting them by eating plants, okay? There are a lot of health benefits that are recognized both in humans and all kinds of animals to carotenoids. They act as antioxidants, they're important in immune system functioning and cell signaling, and they're precursors of retinal tissue, so they're quite important in vision of individuals. Frogs, um, because they have some of these bright colors are probably using them also for predator deterrence in some species or for mate choice in some species as we saw earlier in the more or less tree frogs. Now, the difficult bit about this for amphibians is that frogs, as, as soon as they metamorph, generally don't eat plants. They eat insects that have eaten plants. Okay, so not only do we have to pay attention to actually making sure they get some carotenoids, but we have to make sure that those carotenoids are delivered to them appropriately through whatever uh, diet it is we're feeding them. Okay? So often that's crickets in captivity, and we gut load these crickets when we feed them to our amphibians to improve the nutritional quality. Okay? Now, generally, uh, people treat all crickets as, as being the same. Uh, I originally started out working uh, on insects in my career. So when everybody says, oh, all crickets are the same, I kind of think, no, why would that be true? Um, in the same way that most people who always worked on amphibians would go, no, all frogs are not the same. Um, so what cricket diet is the best diet we could actually do that, you know, use to feed carotenoids to frogs and does it matter which cricket we use? So here's some results of a quick experiment to looking at that. So we've got three species of very commonly used crickets um, for feeding amphibians. Uh, and all of these species were raised on a diet of fish flakes. So the fish up here is actually not fish, but fish, fish food, fish flakes fed to them. Uh, this is bran in the middle, that stuff that generally comes in your tub of crickets when it comes in from the supplier. And at the bottom here is feeding them just on fresh fruit and vegetables that we've chopped up and put in the tank with the crickets. Okay? And so we've fed the crickets up on these different diets and then fed them um, very quickly to the amphibians or we fed them up on the diets and let them, let them sit for a while and empty their guts, so that's the guts of the crickets, to see if there's any residual effect of the carotenoids within the cricket itself that it can pass on to the amphibians. So uh, here is um, an analysis of the carotenoids actually in the crickets themselves. So this is before anything's fed to a frog. So this is after um, several days feeding them on these diets, and then I believe this is 48 hours uh, afterwards when their guts should have been clear. And what you can see is that if you, if you leave your uh, crickets sitting afterwards with no access to foods, well, they're not going to be passing on hardly any carotenoids at all to the crickets that eat them. Uh, and what's more interesting, I think, here is that uh, if you're using bimaculatus, in this case, 
uh, you're actually passing on a whole lot more carotenoids to your amphibians um, than you are if you're using either of these other cricket species. Okay. Now, this is something I would definitely want to see repeated uh, lots of times with lots of different feeder species, but this is a pretty clear answer that all crickets are not created equal in terms of their ability to deliver carotenoids to a frog. So species are not, not equal. Uh, Pinaculatus was best in this particular thing. And the diet that was actually best is a fresh fruit and vegetable diet in terms of delivering carotenoids. Um, and of course, when we let the crickets just empty their guts um, and looked at what carotenoids were left in them, the answer is not very much. So the crickets themselves are a very poor source uh, of carotenoids unless, unless you've properly gut loaded them ahead of time. All right, um, moving on to a bit more uh, in-depth study in uh, black eye uh, uh, tree frogs, more or less tree frog. Um, so this is a species that was uh, getting a lot of interest because at the time it was listed as critically endangered. That's no longer true. I have a question mark there because you may or may not believe that it's, it should have been downgraded. Um, there are very healthy populations in Belize that we worked with um, and they have this very bright carotenoid based color. And what we wanted to know here was for captive reared frogs, are they actually less colorful than wild frogs? Does that really happen? Or is that just a thing that people think happens? Um, and can we actually change that skin color and improve it through the addition of carotenoids to the diet? So uh, we had tadpoles collected from four different lines uh, in Belize and brought back to the UK um, at Chester Zoo. Um, and they were raised all on a standard control diet. And then seven months after we brought them back, uh, after metamorphosis, we switched them on to these three different carotenoid uh, concentration diets. So this is beta carotene that we're um, showing here as the concentration. And then they were maintained on those diets for six months. And um, after that, we measured hind leg color to see if there was a difference in the redness. Okay. Now, now, I'm going to show you that graph because there's, there's no difference at all in lead color between the frogs raised on those different carotenoid diets. Um, but what this graph here is showing us is the coloration of individuals, um, the wild individuals in that Belize population, and um, the founder individuals that were brought back as tadpoles and raised in captivity. And what you can see is that there's that difference between males and females that we saw at the very beginning, um, but wild individuals are far more colorful, far more red in this case, than individuals that were brought back as tadpoles and raised in captivity. So there's a very immediate effect of loss of coloration in this species. We went on uh, a little bit further looking at that um, founding breeding population um, and had individuals. Um, they reproduced very nicely in captivity. So when those offspring uh, reached metamorphosis, we immediately switched sets of them onto uh, um, high carotenoid, which the reddish ones, and lower carotenoid, uh, the F1, uh, sorry, the, the ones on the left here in the yellow coloration. And we kept them on those diets for six months and then measured the orange toe pad coloration. And what you can see is that those individuals that are raised on the higher carotenoid diet are much more bright in terms of the redness uh, of their toe pads than individuals um, that were raised on the lower carotenoid diet. So we know that captive rear individuals come out less colorful than the wild members in the same species. Uh, and we know that we can actually improve that coloration through supplementation, but there was actual a uh, critical period uh, during their growth. So if I just go back for a second, if you look at this graph, this is when individuals were fed carotenoids um, after, after six months. Um, but actually, if we start feeding them right away upon metamorphosis, we can greatly increase the amount of red coloration that's in those in individuals. Okay? 
So they have to have it early on when they come out in metamorphosis. All right, that's lovely. We can make them more red. Uh, that might actually be really important in the wild in terms of mating success. But what about in captivity? Does it have other implications for health? Does it alter the likelihood of having good breeding success uh, in the populations that we have in ex situ conservation? So we went on to do a more in-depth study of looking at fitness-related traits. So what we looked at here were effects uh, right from the tadpole stage. So does the level of carotenoid influence growth development and survival of tadpoles? Uh, how about juveniles? Does it influence their skin coloration and growth, and when they turn into adults, does it influence their breeding success? And then once individuals are being kept as adults, um, does it, you know, is that a permanent effect? Is that color retained? Um, does it change over time? Can we alter it in, in adult individuals? So this is the very beginning. We had tadpoles that we started out with, uh, and they were raised on uh, zero carotenoids added to their diet. Uh, a low level of carotenoids or a high level of carotenoids added to their diet. And then once those individuals metamorphosed, we took each of these lines and split them into a low or a high carotenoid diet um, from each of those tadpole lines. And then after the individuals had um, turned into adults and had a first round of attempted mating, we swapped their carotenoids over to see if there was any, in this case, gain in coloration uh, in these individuals, or ones from high carotenoid to low carotenoid, do they lose their color over time? And that was done again for all of the different original lines back to the different levels of carotenoids in the tadpoles. Not much to talk about in the tadpoles. There was absolutely no effect on the growth, development, or survival of tadpoles in terms of the amount of carotenoids that was added to their diet. Um, so not a big effect there. Uh, if we go on to look at juveniles, um, what we can see is that this again on the y-axis is the amount of red in the toe pads in this case. So those individuals that as juveniles had, a, uh, sorry, as tadpoles had high carotenoid diets, Actually, uh, if we give them uh, high carotenoid once they come out uh, as metamorphs, it doesn't matter what they had as a tadpole. Okay? We can fix the, the thing then. They all go up to having a nice bright coloration. Whereas those individuals that as juveniles are not given carotenoids, um, we can recover a little bit of that um, coloration uh, still coming through here from what they had as tadpoles, but they're not seeing the recovery from what they're being fed as juveniles that we see here. Okay. So um, certainly whatever effect uh, of the um, carotenoids there are, what they're getting as metamorphs, as juveniles, is sort of overwhelming what it is that they had as a tadpole. And this is the same effect of the color of the dorsum. So this is actually the amount of redness measured on the green on the back. I know we don't think of it that way, but you can measure it. Um, and you can see that same sort of effect. So not only do we see an effect here where we see the, the orange or red parts are more bright, but also the rest of the individual becomes uh, quite a bit more bright. And that's sort of shown nicely here. Um, I haven't got a color standard in here, but I, I promise it's not Photoshopped just to look like this. Um, the individuals on the high carotenoid diet look quite bright compared to those in the, uh, kept on the low carotenoid or no carotenoid diets. There's also, interestingly, uh, a difference in juvenile growth. So this, this is a pattern that we don't always observe, um, but we do in some experiments. So this is males on uh, juvenile low or no carotenoids and high carotenoids, and there's no difference between the males in terms of growth rates. But we do see a difference in the females in terms of growth rates uh, in this particular study. Okay? And there are lots of things that we might think about, you know, are females growing um, 
for a longer period of time? Are they trying to get everything in? We know females are going to come out larger than males as adults. So if they have the same developmental period during which they're growing, they must be growing at a faster rate. And then it's possible that they're actually more limited by compounds like carotenoids in their diet uh, acting as antioxidants. That's completely hand wavy guess as to why we might see this effect. Um, don't know why, but it is there. Um, one of the most important things is actually to look at the breeding success effects of this. So we had five females uh, that were on the no carotenoid diet as juveniles and five that were on the high carotenoid diet and they were all allowed to breed and none of the ones without carotenoids bred and four out of five of the ones with carotenoids bred. Uh, so that's pretty clear um, that adding carotenoids to their diets uh, improves their breeding success. At 17 months, we took those individuals and we swapped them over. Uh, those on a low diet went to a high and on a high went to a low. Um, but we didn't really see any effects of that. So these individuals that moved to a high carotenoid diet didn't get more colorful. And those individuals that were on high and went to low, didn't, color didn't fade after three months looking at them. Um, so what they had at that stage, at least for a period of, of three months, seemed to actually um, stick around. So uh, we know carotenoids seem to be influencing growth in females. It definitely in influences their skin color and well, perhaps most importantly has an influence on their breeding success. But there is this critical period for skin color development. They have to get the carotenoids when they come through as metamorphs. If we leave it till later on, we can't recover that coloration. Now, I put this one in uh, to remind me that sometimes we, we are, despite our lovely results, a, a little bit still off the mark. So this is total carotenoid concentration in eggs collected from individuals from captive control, low carotenoid diet individuals, high carotenoid diet individuals. So we can see they do put carotenoids in their, in their eggs and those females that had carotenoids uh, have higher levels of carotenoids in their eggs, but that is really low compared to what wild females are putting into their eggs. So those high levels of carotenoids that we picked uh, were picked based on uh, consultation um, with the literature and chatting to the vet and we sort of thought we had really gone to the upper limit of the amount of carotenoids that we could supply to these individuals. Uh, no, they're getting way more carotenoids in the wild than what we were giving them in our study. This is uh, some more recent work that's done by uh, Jay Newton Ewans in my lab. So this is uh, in golden mantellas. Um, so you can see when they come out, um, uh, just as metamorphs, they're a bit gray. You, you can maybe convince yourself that there's some orange coloration there. Um, <clears throat> but very quickly, they develop that coloration that we're all quite used to seeing in golden mantellas. But that coloration actually depends on carotenoids in their diet and their exposure to UV. So this is another aspect, and I haven't talked very much about this, um, that influences uh, their environment and perhaps the health of individuals. So um, those individuals with an enhanced diet start to become more red from about month four, but if we also give them UV, um, they start to differentiate out as well as being even more bright around month six. You can see the difference here between the individuals where they've got UV and carotenoids, and these ones are on lower carotenoids. So there is uh, an interacting effect with other things that we see uh, in ex situ husbandry. Um, so that's where I finish off. Um, field work is that thing that we have to do uh, to make sure that we're trying to replicate appropriate conditions from the wild, not just what we think ought to be there. Um, but we do need that ex situ conservation research to find out about optimal housing, diet, UV, and all kinds of other things that we need to investigate uh, about diet, adaptation to captivity, and there's a whole world of looking at the microbial communities on their skin, how that's influenced by stress, and how that helps 
protect them from disease in captivity. Now, um, like most professors, I sit in my office and try and get grants for people to do things. Uh, lots of other people actually do lots of work. So most of the work I've talked about today was done by Vicki Ogilvie uh, and by uh, Chris Michaels, who just spoke earlier, um, um, was done in collaboration with Chester Zoo and funded by both NERC and BBSRC. Lots of people contribute to this and huge numbers of undergraduates help us out in the lab in getting all of these studies done and I thank them all for their assistance.